In 2012, I gave the first half of this presentation talking about the kind of toxic evolution of the market mindset, a mindset which was quite innocuous many centuries ago, but has continued to evolve in ever problematic ways, including the resulting consequence of growing environmental and social imbalance, as we all know. And sadly, the market's internal incentive structure and its general mechanics literally doesn't have the vocabulary to solve these problems, as others have alluded to today, which is one of the reasons, perhaps, there are more activist groups and NGOs and socially concerned nonprofits in the world than ever before in absolute and in percentage terms. And if that's not a, a barometer of, of societal health, I'm not quite sure what it is. It's a very telling sign. The implication is that not only is the market as we know it inadequate, as the market is supposed to solve all problems, so is the government as we know it. And both of them have been failing for such a very long time when it comes to problem resolution, people are going way outside of the traditional frameworks as best they can to try and help. Too bad not to be cynical, the vast majority are not going far enough in their thinking about true root problems, some of which I will try and cover today. In part one, emergence of the arbitrary. I will use the stock market as an example of how the system of market capitalism has decoupled from itself, just really speaking, highlighting what I think are very interesting features of crowd behavior in this type of incentive structure, along with revealing what are, I think, the true colors of the market mechanism and the mindset it creates, the true naked colors of what this system actually is when you remove everything that glamorizes it and covers it up and ornaments it in the wrong way. In part two, rational imbalance, I'm going to attempt to show in the most simplistic and accessible relationships possible how the market organizes itself rationally amongst competing players. For those that have ever studied game theory or utilitarian models regarding behavioral economics, kind of obscure, but you've probably come across something called rational choice theory. Rational choice theory means that an individual acts as if they are balancing costs against benefits to arrive at actions that maximize personal advantage. In this context, the term rational has little to do with the commonly accepted definition most of us would consider synonymous with, say, sane behavior. Rather, it assumes that individuals make logical decisions based upon their perception of obtaining the greatest satisfaction oriented by only the game they are focusing on. My goal is to show not only how there is a lack of equilibrium constant in the market, perpetuating economic imbalance, wage imbalance, general inefficiency, and hence the resulting creation of desperation. It's also to show that this thing is so locked in, we can't even avoid the issues because these rational defenses are formed by pressures that are external to the vocabulary of the market economy. An externality, as I will touch upon as I get into it, is something that the market doesn't understand and account for. Examples include technological unemployment, poverty, overconsumption, realized scarcity, growing inequality, climate destabilization, and other such issues that we have talked about at length today. This realization stands in stark contrast to the spectrum of equilibrium theorists who argue that a properly tuned free market would naturally produce, such as full employment, wage stability, equitable distribution, etc. This section will also imply that the idea of a green or humane capitalist economy, given the general consensus of what those value terms mean, is actually structurally impossible as a natural state, showing that no matter how ethical, caring, and environmentally conscious you think you are being, virtually everything in the market moves against these sustainable interests, as evidenced in its total system behavior. Now, this doesn't mean improvement and influence can't be made, and we shouldn't try and be helpful and active, but you're walking against the current greatly, and as I will show, the system's design has some very, very powerful mechanisms that keep it in place without anyone really understanding what these mechanisms are. Everyone thinks about power. We're talking about a structure. And to be clear, system behavior, this is what it's about, is by definition behavior that is unpredicted 
by the behavior of its apparent parts, right? It isn't to say that the behavior can't be understood, but it has to be analyzed as a whole, as much as technically possible, of course, to gain a more accurate picture. This is why the only type of social analysis viable must fall in the context of global statistics and large scale trends over time. It is very, very easy for classical economists today to defend the market by anecdotal scenarios, narrow reductionist proofs, and examples of short-term improvements that basically ignore broader negative trends. In about 15 years, there will be another billion people trying to survive on this planet. Yet, as of now, all life support systems are in decline, and general social destabilization is statistically on the rise. These system results trump all other perspectives as qualifying measures. For example, Numerous corroborating studies show that we need a 60 to 110% increase in food production by 2050. And of course, this stat is not accounting for the fact that 1 billion people today are already not getting enough food to meet their basic nutritional needs. Potable water is worse, with the UN finding that over 65% of the world will experience water stress in just 10 years, with 1.8 billion already living today with true scarcity problems. Pollution, both land, water, and atmospheric, which is already epidemic, has been estimated to continue to rise overall, especially in the countries desperately trying to pull themselves out of third world economic conditions. And as much as we would all would like to see the world you know, come up to a higher standard of living, the industrial methods used by these strapped nations are horribly inefficient and essentially ecocidal. China is a perfect example. 16 out of 20 of the world's most polluted cities are in China. And I see China's development as the path that most other nations are taking, preferring economic growth over environmental sustainability through dirty, cheap industrial methods with no regard. They're just trying to get it done, looking the other way. As far as energy, despite the green rhetoric and the earth stickers stuck to everything being put out by the oil industry, they are spending billions in development of conventional and unconventional hydrocarbons and substantially less on renewables still. Tar sands, fracking, oil shale, horribly polluting, destructive, and have a very weak net energy conversion as compared to conventionals. And it is estimated that we need a 56% increase in world energy by 2040. And guess what? If that increase is gonna come from hydrocarbons, it's gonna be a CO2 pollution disaster because we've already hit the 400 parts per million benchmark. So if we're gonna try and meet this demand with the oil industry, we're in a lot of trouble. As far as resource consumption and loss of biodiversity, a 2011 study found that we need 27 more Earths to keep current rates going by 2050, with losses of 50 to 150 species daily, a level 10,000 times greater than the natural state of species extinction in the fossil record. As far as public health, the WHO has recently stated that cancer rates are expected to surge 57% in the next 20 years, while depression and anxiety disorders continue to also rise. Heart disease, the general global killer, at least in the West mostly, while decreasing in global mortality a bit in the last few decades, is actually increasing in diagnosis. People are just living longer due to medical servicing. And closely tied to such public health is income inequality, which is at its highest rates by some estimates than any time in human history with poverty overall on the rise in the first world nations, with extreme poverty, as it's called, in the third world, staying more or less the same in the long term. Please note that income inequality is not some mere inconvenience. It's a silent killer and social destabilizer. Heart disease, for example, has a direct correlation to inequality, both in terms of absolute deprivation and relative or psychosocial stress pressures. And the last socioeconomic result is the ever-growing unemployment crisis. The flow of reasoning within the market, coupled with the exponential increase in information-based technology and resulting cost decreases of applied technology, will incentivize all businesses to automate over time. Just watch. How can we expect to keep humans meaningfully employed in this climate when keeping cyclical consumption and growth will become more and more elusive as time moves forward and this market logic prevails. Bottom line, anyone who tells you that the market and its underlying mechanisms and incentive structure is exempt from blame regarding these causes, they are either completely and utterly dishonest with themselves, I should say, or they are incredibly poorly informed with respect to the etology of market synergy, the causality. 
Overall, poverty and inequality together are perhaps the most embracing as a result of these pressures, both of which, as TZM knows well, are technically unnecessary given the state of our capacity to actually meet human needs and keep ecological balance at the same time. The structural violence we endure today is an assault and inform a civil human rights violation. And you know, we've watched over the many years increased race equality, gender equality, creed equality, and to a limited effect, legal equality emerge on this planet. Yet most everyone has been conditioned, have you noticed, to stop short of demanding economic equality in the truest sense of the idea. It appears the idea of economic equality is seen as utopian. That is the way people think about it, unattainable. And in the past, this was probably true, but no more, provably. With the phenomenon of ephemeralization, more with less, we can do it. And I hope that the civil human rights groups out there can really realize the merit of this and how the result of this equality through, of course, the installation of a natural all resource based economy, something that I'm not going to talk about today as I have at length in other prior lectures, is the only logical means to do so based on assuring the proper behavioral reinforcers to assure balance, abundance, and sustainability. And to conclude this tangent, when you really trace the etological unfolding of the most damaging problems and fatality in society, logic will lead you to one conclusion. Capitalism is the leading cause of death on the planet Earth, and it's time to change. <laughs>